We're live. Awesome. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Arvind Kumar. I'm your host for tonight's event. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-host Vivian Nu, who is uh, the president of our chapter as well as tech chair, and she's assisting tonight. And I have Ashok Jethanandani in the room with me, and he will help me monitor the chat window. Um, before we begin, I have a quick question to ask all of you. How many of you are attending a Native Land Society talk or meeting for the first time tonight? And if you are, simply go to the chat window and type in a plus, and we'll count the pluses. And if you would, tell us how you found out about today's event. It'll help us figure out how to do better outreach next time. Tonight's guest speaker is Amit Zaveri, and uh, his topic is wildlife of the San Francisco Bay Area. And we have a few quick announcements before the main program begins. For those of you who are attending for the first time, um, plug about the California Native Plant Society. It's a nonprofit environmental organization founded in 1965. Today, it has more than 10,000 members spread in 35 chapters all over California and including Baja California. And our chapter, the Santa Clara Valley chapter covers Santa Clara and Southern San Mateo counties. The Native Plant Society's mission is to save California's native plants and habitats by bringing together science, education, conservation, and gardening to power the native plant movement. So I hope you will join us. We welcome your support of this movement to conserve California's native plant diversity. And as a member, you can enjoy two journals. One's called Fremontia, which is more scientific. Another is called Flora, which is very, very accessible by anybody. Um, in addition, as a member of our chapter, you get the bi-monthly Blazing Star newsletter which contains information about what's going on in the local area. And as a member, you're also eligible to participate in the monthly member plant sales held at Hidden Villa. During COVID times, we have uh, various protocols on how to order, how to pick up your plants. You can find out all the details on the chapter website, but we encourage you to join as a dues paying member at cnps.org slash join. All this information will become available in the chat window, so you don't need to write it down. A few upcoming events on Wednesday, November 11th, the chapter photo group has its monthly photo sharing meeting. And if you haven't been to one of these, it's a peer-to-peer -peer kind of meeting where people bring their pictures to share, they sign up for a slot. Each slot is 15 minutes. They share the pictures, they answer questions. And, you know, it's a nice um, ideas and exchange kind of meeting. On Saturday, November 14th is the annual member meeting. Uh, this meeting is where we elect our officers for the next year. And in the past, before pandemic uh, hit, this used to be a potluck. And uh, it was, I'm, I'm really missing that. And I hope we can bring it back. Um, but first, this year, the meeting is virtual. And the member event starts at 4 p.m. on Zoom. 
and members are eligible to vote for the slate. But at 5 p.m., the general public is invited to a talk given by entomologist author Douglas Tallamy. He's written two excellent books on native plants and habitats and their value to wildlife. And he's, he's a really engaging speaker with amazing slides. Many of the photos he has taken himself in his own garden. And if you haven't seen one of his uh, presentations, it's really worth it. So please join us on Saturday, November 14. Some of you might know that our chapter also offers annual scholarships to worthy graduate students doing research in native plants. The next de application deadline is November 23rd. If you know anybody who's a good candidate, please encourage them to apply. Details are available at the chapter website, cnps-scv.org. Chapter members are continuing to do habitat restoration at various venues in the chapter area, including Edgewood County Park, Alum Rock Park, and Lake Cunningham. If you have the bandwidth and the interest, we encourage you to join one of these uh, volunteer work days and uh, help the environment out. These and many other events are announced on our chapter website, cnps-scv.org. And we also announce them on meetup.com where you can RSVP if you're interested. If you'd like to be informed on a regular basis about chapter activities, please sign up for a mailing list. It's called CNPS SCV News. It's very low volume. It's about once a week and it's announcements only. And to join the mailing list, uh, send an email to cnps-scv-news plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. This is also posted in, in the chat window. And for those of you who enjoy these programs and are available to help us organize them, please, please talk to us. We're looking for someone who can be Q&A moderator, someone who can be a Zoom co-host, someone with video skills to review the YouTube recording, edit it, and prepare it for publishing. And the basic qualifications are that you be comfortable using a keyboard and a mouse, be able to switch windows, be able to do copy and paste. Um, if you have additional skills, that, that's a bonus. So uh, if you can help, please contact Johanna or Madeline. And their information is also in the chat window. And so we come to tonight's program. And uh, I'd like to say a few words that in, in CNPS, we encourage people to learn about the habitat value of native plants, how they provide wildlife with food, shelter, places to raise their young. Tonight's talk is a deviation from our focus on plants. Tonight, we focus on wildlife local to the Bay Area. We hope that it will deepen your knowledge of wildlife and your appreciation of our natural habitats and the vital need to protect, conserve, and save these places for ourselves and for future generations. We're very fortunate to be joined by Amit Zaveri. He's a naturalist and photographer, and he's had a lifelong interest in wildlife from an early age uh, in India. And I know this because my partner Ashok and he went to the same college. For several decades now, he's called the Bay Area his home. And here he's created the informative and unique website, sfbaywildlife.info. If you haven't visited, you must check it out. It's full of great detailed information. Tonight, he will share pictures and commentary about when, where, and how to experience wildlife. A few housekeeping notes, please mute your microphones if you haven't done so already so that we can all enjoy the program without interruption. Amit actually welcomes your questions or comments as they occur to you. So please type them into the chat box and we will be monitoring that and we will address them to the speaker at suitable intervals throughout the program. We expect that the program will conclude by 9 p.m. 
So welcome Amit and take it away. Thank you very much, Arvind. So we're going to talk about wildlife of the Bay Area. And as Arvind said, wildlife, I think of it as an adjacency to plants. Or in some ways, you can say wildlife encompasses plants too. So over the next hour, I will do a fast paced sweep through the rich variety of wildlife that can be found in the Bay Area. The in this incredible wealth is so accessible to us within a couple of hours travel time at the most. And, you know, an hour or so will barely do justice to this topic. But the idea is to provide a glimpse into this wonderland and to awaken a desire to explore it further. I think it is bears repeating that wildlife and its habitat are inextricably linked. To be able to appreciate wildlife, we have to acknowledge the importance of natural habitat and the plant community is an integral and extremely important part of that. So even though I'm mostly going to focus on animal life, it is clear that there is no you know, animal life without plant life being part of it, which is, I think, something that this audience probably knows already pretty deeply. So when we say the Bay Area, traditionally it is the nine counties around the Bay, but I also include Santa Cruz County and some of the marine areas along the coasts of Monterey County, because for our purposes, that is all sort of part of the Bay Area. And then a couple of other exceptions, which I'll call out as we talk about that. And when we talk about wildlife, what I'm going to focus on, like I said, is animal life, vertebrate and invertebrate. I know plants should be somewhere in here too. And same thing on my website, I've actually had an interaction with a couple of, two or three different people from the Native Plant Society that I ought to really include plants. and. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. The problem, one of my problems is that there is such a wide variety of plants. There's just so many species that it gets kind of difficult how to accommodate all that. I started getting interested in plants more recently and I already have photographs and identifications for about 240 species in the Bay Area. So it's an interesting challenge. If any one of you is, has bright ideas around that, I'm, I'm all yours. And as far as the animal life is concerned, the variety we have, we have over 50 species of mammals, over 400 birds, about 34 or so reptiles, 19 or so amphibians. Fish is another area which is very hard to kind of get your arms around. I'm slowly learning some of this there. Butterflies and uh, Odonata, which is dragonflies and damselflies. Those are pretty interesting. So I've, I'm calling them out separately. And then there's a ton more of insects and other invertebrates. And all of this is, you know, comprising the wonderful variety of wildlife. So we'll first start with mammals. And to me, the iconic mammal, when you talk about wildlife of the Bay Area, is the puma, the mountain lion. And it's just so exciting, even I've not yet seen one, but to know that you are walking around in the wilderness, in the natural areas where this magnificent predator is also walking around. Uh, so you might be familiar with, there is a professor at UC Santa Cruz who's done a very long-term ongoing study of the puma. It's called Santa Cruz Pumas. And they have radio collared a bunch of them. They know a lot about their movements. And now they're putting all that to practical use. It's helping decide where the tunnels will go under Highway 17 to provide connectivity with, uh, for the habitat on both sides. And also one interesting use case I heard about was that when a new open space is being planned at San Vicente, which was I think acquired by uh, the, one of the land trusts there, Santa Cruz Land Trust most likely, they're actually using data from uh, this uh, radio tracking to decide where the trails should be so they can avoid disturbing some of the areas that the Pumas like to rest in or tend to have you know, with their young. So that's pretty interesting. And the other cat, of course, is the bobcat. And sometimes people confuse between the two. 
one very, very clear signal that you can look for is the tail. The bobcat is a very short tail and the puma is a very long tail. Of course, there are other differences if you know what you're looking for, but often people confuse between these two and kind of report a mountain lion when they've seen a bobcat. The gray fox is another pretty cool inhabitant of the Bay Area. And this particular photo was actually taken in my backyard. We were so lucky to have one of these guys visit us a couple of years back. Apart from being really cute looking, they have a very interesting, oh, but by the way, one of the things you want to distinguish is that between coyote and gray fox, a coyote is bigger and has a, you know, a sort of more uniform color. And then the red fox is the other fox found in the Bay Area. But the gray fox has a black tip to the tail and the red fox has a white tip to the tail. So that's another thing that you often see even if you see a glimpse of it moving away from you. But the really cool thing about gray foxes is that they climb trees. It's only one of like, I think from by now they've figured out there's three other members of the dog family canids that climb trees all around the world. And the gray fox is one of them. And they actually have an adaptation of their uh, bones, of the, the radius and ulna, the way they rotate against each other, that enables them to climb trees. And they will climb trees for food or they'll climb trees to escape predators. This particular one, I think, was trying to get away from a coyote. And this, so most of the photos I'm showing, sharing today are mine. A few are not, and I've called out the credit where they are not mine. This is a long-tailed weasel, another really cool carnivore of the Bay Area. This one's not very rare, but you don't see it as often. But randomly people see it as they are hiking or walking around. And when they do see it, it doesn't seem to be too shy. People seem to be able to take photographs and get good looks at it. And after a long, long wait, I was lucky enough to see them very well a couple of years back. There is a regional park in Sonoma County where suddenly they appear. It seems it has happened a couple of times and it happened this time. And they were just extremely, uh, what's the word, not uh, friendly. They were not afraid of people. And they were playing around in the fields there, bump, jumping in and out of holes. And I mean, I got, finally, I, I, you know, I'd taken like so many photos, I had to stop. And there was just, there were people, local people there who would come out there with a blanket in the evening, just sit there and watch the weasels and just enjoy it. This was their entertainment. Do they like grassland habitat? So they're, I think, mixed grassland and woodland from what I can make out. Okay. There, was, there is woodland adjacent to it. So I think there's a particular time of year, maybe because of the you know abundance of gophers and the ease of catching them or something that they were invading sort of this field. And then they disappeared. And then in subsequent years, it's not been the same sort of phenomenon. Here's the striped skunk, which is another member of the weasel family. And again, they're they are actually very, very used to the urban area, the suburban areas. And we have one that goes through our backyard. We can make out by the smell. And many of you might have the same experience. You don't see them as often, although you do see them when you're hiking around or driving around sometimes. But they're definitely there. And for the most part, they, you know, they don't cause any harm. If you leave them alone, they're not going to spray at you or this is a mother with a couple of young and pretty much all the photos I'm going to show you are taken in the Bay Area and like I said most of them are mine just a few exceptions to that this is another member of the weasel family the sea otter and one of the very cool facts about this I was very thrilled when I saw it is because when Long back, I read about it being one of the earliest examples of tool using amongst animals. And then to come to the Bay Area and around Monterey to actually see one and see it using a tool, which is a stone it uses to break open the shells. And they've been known to carry that stone around with them if they find one that is suitable in terms of weight and size. And they kind of tuck it under their armpit and keep it with them. And then when they find a, a shellfish of, of some kind, they will lie on their back like this and they will hit the shell against the stone to crack it open. It's 
it's pretty cool and it's relatively easy to see this behavior if you go down to the coast around Monterey Bay. And they are also members of the weasel family otters. And this is the other, the other kind of otter. So the first one, the sea otter is a marine creature it, like salt water. And this is a river otter, which is found in fresh water. These are all over the Bay Area. We have a question. Um, yes. Amit. Uh, Vivian wants to know what do skunks eat? Skunks? Yeah. Uh, I think grubs, insects, small other small creatures. Okay. And while we are at it, there's a comment from Erin about your comment about including plants on your website. Uh huh. She's suggesting you could try linking your website to Calscape, that they have an extensive list of California native plants. Sure. So I, 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 if I'm not already linked it, absolutely I will. I have a section where I have links to other sites with more information, and absolutely that that goes without saying. If I've not done it, like I said, I'll do it. I also have a link to California Native Plant Society because I have a section on organizations concerned with nature and wildlife, and it's already linked there. Thank you. Okay, so now moving from carnivores, we go to rodents. And this is the American beaver. So this was a very interesting comeback story in the Bay Area. They were almost gone. And maybe about 15 years back, uh, I think they most likely first appeared at Martinez. There is a small creek that runs through town. And in the creek, they noticed beavers. And there is a group of people there they actually formed a group to save the beavers because the city was trying to get rid of them. They were worried that they would undermine the banks and that would lead to problems. So this group formed and they were able to uh, save the beavers. I think it's called uh, Bertha Dam was the name of the group. And they got everybody all excited and they started a beaver festival that now goes on every year, virtual of course this last year, but, and they attract a lot of different organizations and this, for a long time, this was so cool because it was so easy. You could drive up to that area in Martinez, just walk by the, uh, drive, uh, park by the park and then walk in and see beavers in the evening. This particular location now, for some reason, they've abandoned it. So they're still there on that creek, but now they're not as easy to see. But meanwhile, the population of beavers around the Bay Area has started spreading. So they are on the, in Guadalupe Creek. They are in... Um, uh, Napa, uh, on the Napa River. So they're being seen in a few other places. They are at Lexington Reservoir and there are more and more sightings being reported of beaver. And of course, uh, you know, they're really cool with their whole behavior of how they create these lodges and, uh, you know, they bring, their, they bring up their young in there. And one of the interesting things that happened was that because beavers like to maintain a water level at a certain way, they sometimes create a problem with the uh, drainage. So what some clever people had figured out is there is a little device they have built called a beaver deceiver. And they install that device at a particular uh, height below the water with an intake and then with an outtake further downstream. And it creates an illusion to the beaver that water is flowing through the way it wants it to. So it stops messing with it. And so that has actually saved them in many places where putting one of these devices has convinced city council not to get rid of them, not to exterminate them. I mean, there's a question. Sure. Where do we go to see the river otters? River otters is not an easy single place. One good place that I know of is called Grizzly Island in the Delta. And there you drive along these roads. It's not a very good hiking place but you have a very decent chance of seeing otters there. That's one of the places. But people are seeing also Point Reyes. A lot of people see them around Abbott's Lagoon and uh, areas in Point Reyes is another good place. Okay. And I think Rodeo Lagoon in Marin County was another place that people were seeing river otters. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't Couple have a very, very specific location, but you have a, if you go to these sort of aquatic habitats, then you have a chance of seeing them. And again, they, they seem to be increasing the population, so you have a better chance now. There's an organization, you can uh, find them on my website, there's a link that studies the river otters and that have a lot of information about river otters. Okay. 
A couple of comments. Uh, Robin says skunks might eat small slugs also. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, yeah, all kinds of little critters like that, correct. And Philip is saying he digs out yellow jacket nests. Ah. And the skunk, skunks love the larvae. Interesting. Okay, so that's something I didn't know. And so they must be willing to put up with the attacks. <laughs> or maybe they do it at night and they don't get attacked. Yeah. This yeah skunks tend to be nocturnal, so... Okay, so the California ground squirrel is relatively common. You've probably all seen it. And there are two reasons why I wanted to include it. One is it's the only mammal plant combination photo that I could th think of to throw into this presentation. So I thought, okay, I have to include this. And the other was that uh, what I saw, were, I thought was interesting behavior. I've never seen it, but apparently it is known is that this particular one was climbing about 40 to 50 feet up in an oak tree to grab acorns and bring them down to the ground level. And it did it repeatedly. So I never, I never thought ground squirrels would go that high up a tree, but apparently they do. Interesting. So these are tuli elk. This is the smallest species of, subspecies of elk. So there's like three, subs, uh, four subspecies of elk across the US. And this is the smallest of them. And these are endemic to California. This is another great conservation story where they, they were down to a very, very small number at one point. And then through sort of careful captive breeding and now they've been released back. Their numbers are actually in, in a few thousand now. And they're very easy to see at Point Reyes. This photo is from Point Reyes. But they're also seen in a few other places that around Coyote Valley they are seen on a couple of those preserves. And then around Sunol Regional Park and on Mines Road, I've seen them. So, and they are reintroducing them to a few selected places in California. Pretty magnificent creature and it's pretty nice to be able to see it. It's cousin of course, which is much more common is the mule deer uh, that you see most of the time. So then uh, moving from land animals, we'll take a little bit of a detour to marine mammals. And again, I, I feel we are blessed in the Bay Area to have this incredible variety of marine mammals that you can see if you go on what are called pelagic trips. You have to invest a bit of time to, to see something interesting. You have to go on a trip that's like of the order of six hours or so. But if you take one of those trips, you get far enough out. Basically, you have to get out to where the submarine canyon is deeper, and then you start seeing much more interesting uh, marine life. <clears throat> and most people are familiar with the gray whale, which comes every year in migration in winter. In fact, sometime late November is when they start showing up, and then they go down to Baja, California. So through November and December, they're going south. They breed there, they have their young, and then March, April, they come back up north. And you again get a chance to see them. You have a better chance of seeing them when they're going south. They seem to stay closer to the coast. And they're a little farther out when they come back up. But that was the classic kind of whale watching experience. But turns out we have whales year round almost. And in summer, you can go see humpback whales. Or, and in fall, you can see blue whales. Humpback whales are there for a much longer time, both in the Monterey Bay area and around the Farallon Islands. And blue whales seem to show up mostly maybe June, July at the earliest, but you have a better chance in September or October. And most years you have a very good chance at seeing a blue whale. And again, I found that was like incredible. This is the largest living land, largest living animal of any kind uh, that ever lived. I think it's bigger than any dinosaur that ever lived, right? And to be able to see that kind of in our backyard, so to say, within an hour and a half's drive, you can get onto a boat trip to go see a blue whale. To me, that's kind of a real treat. Now, apart from these, there is a whole variety of other uh, marine uh, cetaceans, as they're called. There's several species of whales. In particular, the famous one is the orca whale. They regularly come to the Bay Area. People have actually seen them hunting gray whales in Monterey Bay. And then there is a variety of dolphins and porpoises that you can also see if you go on these pelagic trips. Sometimes from shore, you tend to see the bottlenose dolphins or the harbor porpoise. 
but the others you really have to get onto a boat trip to go see that. So the more common pinniped is the California sea lion that probably everybody's seen in the you know, famous kind of with tourists. But the Northern elephant seal is a very cool pinniped that again, you can see in the Bay Area, the one pla two places you can see them nowadays. One is that Anonavevo, that is the original place from where they became famous. But now there is a colony building up at Point Reyes also. But Anonavevo, you get to see an incredible spectacle in winter. So the time is kind of coming up. And you know the males come ashore and they are like fighting each other for breeding rights. And then they will have a whole harem of females on the beach. And that whole thing is, is a spectacle. It's a wildlife spectacle. Uh, they have guided talks all through the season and they're pretty popular. So now they tend to get full your <clears throat> book in advance. Meet question. But, yeah. This is about <coughs> the whales. Yeah. Vivian wants to know how far north do the whales go in the Bay Area? Well, so I think they're there. Uh, they go all along the coast, all the way to Washington or whatever. So the gray whales come from Alaska. They go down to Baja California and go back up to Alaska. The humpback whales seem to be all over the place. They're being seen, you know, in many, you know, they can be seen offshore all along the Bay Area, essentially. And that's the famous one every once in a while that makes a wrong turn and swims up the river. There was this one called Humphrey that became pretty famous in the news. And that's the humpback whale. The blue whales, I'm not sure of the range. They're, def they're probably a little more picky, but they are seen off Farallon Islands and of Monterey Bay. <coughs> Thank you. See? So yeah, I, I would highly encourage people if you really want to see a you know, wildlife spectacle to go see the elephant seals in the, on their breeding grounds. And like I said, if, if, if you can't get onto the tour, some now the population has increased so much that there's a spillover where some of them you can see on the beach, which is not part of the official tour, but but to see the main kind of breeding spectacle, you have to get onto the docent led tours. So we are about to transition from mammals to birds, but uh, sounds like Arvind, you have caught up with the questions. Okay. So we will start with these, uh, the egrets and herons. A lot of times people mistake them for cranes because the, gray, uh, the great blue heron in particular, and then there is a large great egret, large egret, which is, they're pretty big. And if people don't know, they think that might be a crane, but they're not. And this is the snowy egret that I'm showing, which is smaller. And it has this bright yellow feet that you see. So you know it's a snowy egret. And they have these beautiful plumes, the feathers during breeding season. And in fact, that's how the Audubon Society got started was there was a huge market in these plumes for putting into ladies' hats. So they were killing egrets, tons of them in Florida in particular, I think. And then there was this group of people who wanted to stop that and that kind of led to the formation of the Audubon Society. And you can also, one interesting thing with both the great blue heron and the great egret is you'll often see them hunting in the fields away from water. And they'll be hunting wolves and gophers and things like that. I mean, another question. Sure. How do you, this is actually from YouTube. Soul Ninja wants to know, how do you spell the place where the Northern elephant seals live? Anno Nuevo, A-N-O-N-U-E-V-O. Thank you. And, you know, I would, again, encourage people if they would go to the website, sfwildlife.info, most of this information in some form or the other might be, uh, you, you can find it there. And then towards the end, I will flash the URL and uh, my email address. Okay. So this is another wildlife spectacle, is the snow geese. Every winter, you get thousands and thousands of water birds that include snow geese and another really pretty bird, which is the swan, the tundra swan. And these, this is the one exception I was talking about where you have to drive a little bit. You have to go to the Central Valley. From the East Bay, it's about an hour's drive. From the South Bay, it might be an hour and a half. But every winter, you have this incredible spectacle. Where is this? 
So there's uh, two or three locations. There's one called Woodbridge Road, which is very good off Highway 5, kind of north of Stockton. Mm -hmm. And then there's another new place, a relatively new place called Staten Island, which was acquired by the Nature Conservancy. And that has become a very nice place to go see the waterfall. You'll see, you know, different species of goose. There's like three or four. There's snow geese, there's white fronted geese. There's the Canada geese, of course, and there's cackling geese. And then you get the tundra swans. And then you also get the sandal cranes there. So all of this is in that one area. And the third location there is Kozumnes Preserve, which is a little bit further up five. So this is all on Highway 5 uh, between Sacramento and Stockton. Wonderful. And it's it's something, you know, again, very special to be able to see that within such a short distance of the Bay Area, I think. And the cranes are, you know, large size, very, very pretty, a lot, lot of interesting. Uh, and sometimes you'll see them in flocks and flying in V formation and all that. This is the Ridgeways Rail. So this species is not endemic to California, but it's near endemic. It's found around California and a few adjacent areas in Nevada, Arizona, and Baja California, Mexico. It's endangered, it's federally endangered. And it used to be part of a species called the clapper rail, but recently they split it apart. So Ridgeways rail is split away from the uh, rest of clapper rail. Again, even though it's endangered and relatively rare, but in the Bay Area, you have a pretty good chance to see it if you go to these uh, mud flat kind of areas around the Bay. So Palo Alto Baylands is a good place. I've seen them there uh, around Oakland, all along the Bay, essentially anywhere. Them, you can see them and they're usually skulking in the vegetation, but every once in a while they give a nice view like this one did. The California condor, this is an absolutely magnificent species. This is another great conservation story. They were down to about 20 birds or so at one point. And I actually remember I saw three of those 20 way back and like Arvind says, I'm giving away my age, but that's okay. And um, after that, they decided that it was, they were, their numbers were so precarious that they captured all of them. They started a breeding program and now they are being introduced back into the wild. And I've been lucky enough to see them flying free in the Big Sur area. It's kind of like nice coming full circle. And uh, there's about uh, 160 or so flying in California right now. And there's more of them. They have now established colonies in different places. Uh, they're flying in the Grand Canyon. They're flying in some place in Utah. They're flying in Baja, California. And in close to the Bay Area, Big Sur is the one of the great place to see them. And the other place is Pinnacles National Park. And I think right now you might even have a better chance of seeing them at Pinnacles than at Big Sur. It's something to see this large bird soaring above you. Oh, and then during the recent wildfires, there's a little bit of a setback. Two chicks died and then about nine adults seem to be missing. They're not sure yet. So. And then the there was a place where they were uh, keeping them. There was a center where they kind of prepared them for release and all that. So that got destroyed with the fires and they're rebuilding that. So the Ventana Wildlife Society is doing a really good job with that. And if you feel like it, you should probably donate to them to help with this effort. Mm -hmm. Another great uh, species is the golden eagle, which, uh, you know, you can, you have a very good chance of seeing this in the Bay Area, actually. If you go out into uh, particularly the Diablo range, which, you know, goes all the way down to Mount Hamilton area, they are, it has one of the highest densities of golden eagles uh, in the US, it seems. And on the right, I'm just showing you a comparison. So, you know, once you kind of know what you're looking for, they're just so different from uh, the turkey vultures, which is the, what you're seeing most of the time, or red tailed hawks, which would be probably a similar size. So, they're much, much bigger and they have some distinct coloration. This is probably like relatively common, but I threw it in because 
a male that is displaying like this is probably something many people have not seen. So even the relatively common and drab turkey can be pretty, pretty cool to look at. And their population seems to be exploding in the Bay Area at this time. We have a variety of owls that are found in the Bay Area. I've selected two to show you here. They're mostly nocturnal, but sometimes you can glimpse uh, like the great horned owl, which is nocturnal, but in the daytime, if you find it roosting somewhere, you, you'll get a daytime look at it. And that's how I was able to photograph this one on the left. And that's a very large owl. And then the one on the right is a burrowing owl. So that's a diurnal owl. So that's unusual for an owl that it's out in the daytime. And that one is highly uh, threatened at this point. Their population has really gone down in the Bay Area. They used to be found in several places, including Mission College. They, they had a colony on their land, but that one's gone pretty much. So right now there's only like two colonies, I think in the South Bay that I uh, have heard of. One is in the, um, there's a land owned by the water district around Alviso. So they are being conserved there and there's, they have a small colony going there. And then there's another small colony at Shoreline Park in Mountain View. Now we do get an influx of them in winter, which come in temporarily and that, then they are spread out in other areas, but the breeding is confined to these uh, couple of areas. They're really cute to look at. They're small. And when they're like sitting down there in the vegetation, they can be pretty hard to pick out. Once you find one, and they're a little bit comical the way they look and bob with their heads. So that's the acorn woodpecker. <clears throat> that one, the, you must have all seen it. It's very, very uh, prominent if you go out into the natural areas and it's very loud. But there's a couple of interesting things about it. One is, of course, the larder it creates. So it takes these acorns and caches them in a tree. And apparently, they only do it to dead trees. So they're not you know, harming living trees by doing that. And they live in a family group. And the uh, sort of grown-up young help with taking care of younger ones in terms of helping with food and other duties. So they live in this uh, nice large family group and they will defend their territory against other groups of woodpeckers and other species. Amit, so we, uh, will you take a question? Sure. Um, Sol Ninja from YouTube wants to know, do turkeys stay in groups like some types of birds such, such as quail? Uh, turkeys do grow in groups, correct. Yes. Okay. In fact, you almost yeah. always see them in groups. A bunch of females, typically, okay. but a few males. And, and for my memory, could you repeat the three locations for in the Central Valley for the birds, migratory okay. birds? Sure. How about this? I can uh, type them into the chat window at the end. Sounds great. Okay. All right. So now we come to uh, the crow family. Jays are part of the crow family. And we have two species that are fairly common around the Bay Area, the Stellar's Jay on the left and the Scrub Jay on the right. The Scrub Jay is the more common one you might see in your backyard. The Stellar's Jay tends to be in slightly more wild places, slightly higher up in the hills. But they are not too shy and they all, of course, unfortunately, they come for any uh, leftovers that uh, picnickers might leave and things like that. So it's best not to encourage that behavior, particularly for the Stellar's Jay, because it's, it's more of the, in, in the wilderness area and you don't want it depending on food. But they are very spectacular birds to look at. And some people mistakenly call them blue jays, but there's a species called blue jay, which is found on the east, eastern half of the US. So we don't get the blue jay here. What we get is these two, Stellar's Jay and Scrub Jay. There's another member of the crow family is the yellow-billed magpie. So this one is endemic to California. And in fact, it's not even spread throughout California. It's mostly the Bay Area and some adjacent parts of the Central Valley, but it doesn't go all the way down to like uh, LA or San Diego area. And it's a pretty, pretty neat looking bird, fairly large. They will sometimes be in very large groups and they're very intelligent birds like all members of the crow family. And you see them, you know, uh, many places. I've seen them in the South Bay. I've seen them in the East Bay. 
they will not prefer you know the kind of santa cruz mountains kind of habitat they'll be in the more open habitats so that's a black phoebe it's a kind of fly catcher it's relatively common in suburban settings it comes to my backyard it probably comes to many of your backyards they like to be near water in our case we don't have water but our neighbor has a swimming pool and maybe that's why i see it in my backyard and it's it's a kind of fly catcher pretty little bird the white crown sparrow so this is a species of sparrow where there's a bunch of sparrows found in north america but what is one reason i included so there's a couple of things about this one is that there's two populations of this white crown sparrow there is a population that comes uh, in winter uh, during migration from the north and they are with us for a while in, during winter and they go away but there is a resident population along the coast that is here all year mm. and recently there was an article in science about the fact that there were some scientists who were studying their songs and they found that the male white crowned sparrows in the san francisco area and a bay area changed their song because of the covid situation because covid has led to less human noise they were able to adjust their song and take advantage of that and this was documented and published in science and i thought that was pretty cool that that was a study done in the bay area since there's so many birds and we don't really have time to hit all of them on slides i thought i'll just show you a selection that kind of gives you a glimpse of the variety the color and all that that you see with birds in the bay area it's uh, just quickly it's western bluebird wilson's warbler red-winged blackbird dark-eyed jungle house finch and lark sparrow so where would i see the lark sparrow the lark sparrow uh, you would see again i think in any of the open habitats so probably uh, coyote valley kind of a, uh, parks you should see them i see them a lot in uh, east bay in sunol in morgan territory mount diablo area yeah and it's a really pretty pretty sparrow yeah. so all around mount hamilton that area you should be able to see them i think uh, yeah. okay thank you maybe elm rock maybe um, you know at levin park All right. So now we move to reptiles, which may not be everybody's favorite thing, but I love reptiles. I particularly love snakes. So okay. sorry to interrupt, but <laughs> Hidden wants to know what was the yellow bird in the last slide? That is a Wilson's warbler. Mm. It's a pretty little bird, and it's relatively common. They tend to be closer to water, typically around streams, and that's where they nest. Riparian habitat. Thank you. so we have several species of snakes in the bay area and in particular i wanted to call these two out because there is often confusion between gopher snake and rattlesnake and um, but once you kind of start looking for the differences you can see that uh, gopher snake has a much narrower head and if you look at the tail area it's very different of course the, the rattles may or may not be there on a rattlesnake but typically they will have the rattles but the shape is still different and overall the rattlesnake is probably a little more uh, thicker anyway once you kind of get to know them you don't have to worry so much and with rattlesnakes as long as you give them a wide berth you know in fact you don't even see them that often even though they are all over the bay area so mostly they are avoiding you if you happen to find one it will if you listen for the warning rattle and kind of be careful and step away you'll be fine this is the california king snake which is one of the interesting snakes and one characteristic of it this one is that it actually kills and hunts uh, hunts and kills other snakes and eats them including rattlesnakes mm -hmm. so so this is a good snake to have around for many people this 
this is an alligator lizard, in particular, southern alligator lizard. So we have two uh, kinds of alligator lizards in the Bay Area. One is the northern alligator lizard and the one is southern. Southern is the one I think you're more likely to see, the one that I've seen more often. And it's actually pretty spectacular. They can be pretty big. And they don't seem to be once, you know, when, when they see you, often they will stare at you and, you know, not like run away immediately. So you might get pretty good look at them. This one was at Alam Rock Park. And actually you can make out on its neck there are ticks. I've often seen them with ticks on them. Well, there's another cool thing that I came across somewhere else. There's another lizard called a Western fence lizard, which is also common in the Bay Area. And apparently that one somehow neutralizes the parasite, the thing that causes Lyme disease. So if a tick bites a Western fence lizard, the Lyme disease causing organism and it can die. So apparently it'd be a good thing to have more Western fence lizards around. This is the only wild species of wild turtle that we have that's kind of native to California. You will often see these other turtles that are called sliders, that, but those are all uh, captives that were released. So they are very popular in the pet stores. People buy them, kids will buy them and they're like small and cute. And then, then they grow up, they kind of don't want them anymore and they go release them in some random pond. So a lot of places around the Bay Area have built up populations of sliders. But this one is the native turtle. And this one's not endangered, but it's a species of special concern. And there are some efforts to do some captive breeding and uh, try and increase their population. So from reptiles, we'll move on to amphibians. This is a Sierran tree frog. This one has changed names a couple of times. So you may be, you may have heard of it as the Pacific chorus frog. This is the loud calling that you hear most of the time. It's incredibly loud in the breeding season, you know, once there are rains and ponds. And only once I was lucky enough to see a breeding pond and you could see the swelling of their throat sacs and they were all singing away very, very loudly and then they're threatening each other and fighting with each other, males. It's a pretty cool sight. But they're, they're found, you know, all over the Bay Area and you'll very likely come across them. And pretty, pretty nice looking. They have a couple of different colors. Sometimes you'll see green, sometimes it can be brown. And there's some other frogs in the Bay Area also. In particular, there is the red-legged frog, which is um, endangered, which is, I think federally endangered uh, species. That's the one you often see a lot of these uh, lawsuits and things over because it's an endangered species. So that one is not as uh, uh, easy to see and not as widespread, but you do, if in the right habitat, you do come across them. I mean, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, going back to the king snake. Is okay. the California king snake venomous? No, it's not. Or harmful to humans? No, it's not. But it will attack and eat a rattler? It can attack and eat it, yes. It, it specializes in uh, eating other snakes and it, including a rattler. So I'm assuming it's, uh, you know, it doesn't get affected by the venom, but I, I don't remember whether I read that specifically or not. Okay. But Thank you. So the rattlesnake, the western rattlesnake, is the only venomous snake in the Bay Area. So once you learn to recognize it, everything else, there's like 10 other species of snakes, they're all non-venomous. You don't have to worry about them. And the technically correct term is venomous versus poisonous. Apparently poisonous is poison is something that harms you if you eat it, whereas venomous is something that bites you and you get the venom. Thank you. Okay, so another amphibian that is interesting is the California newt, which is, you know, we are about to again come into the season where there, there should be lots of newts, particularly if we get decent rains. Almost any of the hilly areas around the Bay Area, if you go hiking in the rainy season, you can, you'll see California newts. So they have a very potent neurotoxin that they secrete out of their skin. And so you want to be really careful if you handle one, you don't want to you know, then touch, touch to your mouth without washing your hands carefully. But it seems that, uh, so the garter snakes are the predators that feed on the newts. 
and there is what uh, has been termed as a co-evolutionary arms race going on between the garter snakes and the newts. Whereas the newts, you know, get their toxin to be more potent and the garter snakes develop more immunity to it and then the newts try to develop it. So it's like on, it's been ongoing apparently. There's uh, several newt species in the Bay Area. There's three that are very similar to this one. This is in the genus Tareka, and there's a rough-skinned newt and the red-bellied newt. And since we have time, I'm going to talk about the red-bellied newt just a little bit. So there's a really interesting story around this creature. So its normal habitat is it's more like Sonoma County, and it doesn't come all the way to the South Bay. But a disjunct population was discovered in the Stevens Creek watershed in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And there's a, if I can share the link sometime later, there's some people like have been studying and trying to figure out how they got here. And there was a theory at one point, maybe they got released out of some Stanford research program, but that has got, that doesn't seem like it holds water. So at this time, I think they haven't quite figured out how this population got started here, but it's thriving. And I was lucky enough this early this year, January, in fact, I went hiking, uh, I think Upper Stevens Creek Park and uh, saw them on right on the trail. They're crossing the trail and happy. And since newts move very, very slowly, once you see one, it's very easy to kind of follow it for a while and take photos and all that nice stuff. And it's spectacularly different colored. The, the red really stands out. So it's not like they could have been missed all these years if the population was there. So I mean, there are theories where is there like an island, you know, how you get these evolutionary islands where habitats get fragmented and then a little bit of that habitat remains and it contains a few species which don't have a continuous population with the rest of its kind. So this one, they're not sure if that's the reason why they are still found in this area or what, but th there's a couple of very nicely written uh, set of articles that made a big, like nice mystery story out of this that I enjoyed a lot. And if you go looking for them in winter, you might be able to see the red belly dudes. Couple of questions. I mean, um, is the Pacific chorus frog the same frog you showed or it's different? Yes, yes. They, they've changed names on that frog two, three times. They've changed the scientific okay. name, they've changed the common name. It's kind of a pain. Okay. Yeah. It's, and it's another, question, another yeah. question about uh, the snakes. Yes. Uh, so Ninja wants to know, are there no copperheads in the Bay Area? No, there are none. Again, copperhead is a venomous snake. The only venomous snake is the rattlesnake, the Western rattlesnake. We only get one species of rattlesnake and that's the only venomous snake we get in the Bay Area. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on to fish. Of course, like the puma is for mammals, I think the great white shark is for fish. To me, it's like an awesome predator that, that, and again, you know, they're found all along the coast near the Bay Area. They're found around the Farallon Islands, they're found, they do not come into the Bay, maybe just a little bit they've been seen inside the Golden Gate, but uh, around the coast and in Santa Cruz, people are seeing them quite often now, it seems like. In fact, the other day, a friend of mine sent me a video of the fin slicing through the water. But they are pretty awesome predator and it's kind of cool to know that they're around. Although once in a while, the divers who get attacked don't think it's that cool. Apart from that, there's uh, another thing that again, I didn't have um, there's too much to cover with slides, but uh, you see salmon in the Bay Area again in this season, once the rains really get going. And there's a couple of places where uh, there's a good chance you can see salmon where they come up to lay their eggs. A, a, particularly in Marin County, that is, is a good place. And there's a whole bunch of other fish that uh, it's very hard to kind of learn about, very hard to see them. So taking photos, all that's very difficult. Okay, so now the, we were still on vertebrates, now we'll move to invertebrates. And of course, you know, the Native Plant Society people must be very, very familiar with butterflies. Here's a variety of butterfly species that you see around the Bay Area. And there's more, this is just a sampling. And one thing you might notice is that I've, the selection is based on the fact that there is a plant or flower in, 
you know, with, with the butterfly in each of these photos. So this was specifically done for this talk. Uh, just, I can quickly go over the species. So there is the variegated, uh, sorry. So the, sorry, variable checker spot at the top left. And then there's the Ekman blue. Then there is the Gorgon copper. Then there is the golden hair shriek. Then to the right of that is the ringlet, California ringlet. Below that is the Sarah orange tip. And that's actually an, another shot of the Gorgon copper, but with the wings open. And the bottom row is the orange sulfur, the Western tiger swallowtail, which is, you know, as you might have seen in the blurb for the invite. But that's a very common butterfly. And actually, it's, again, adapted very well to suburban areas. I see them flying around office buildings in Mountain View all the time. And then there's the Mylita Crescent. And then there's the common checkered skipper. And oh, I forgot to call out. I know some of the plants they are on. The Gordon Copper is on the gum plant. The Mylita Crescent is on Penny Royal, which is a non-native plant. And the... Um, Orange sulfur is on, uh, I think it's a yellow star thistle, which is another invasive weed. And the other thistle species, I don't know what species of thistle, there's two thistles you see, the Western tiger swallowtail and the Sarah orange tail. Looks like both thistle. Oh, and the Ekman blue is on uh, another non-native flower. I think it's a trefoil, bird's foot trefoil. So this particular butterfly is a Western pygmy blue. So it's very specialized to certain habitats. It, um, it's usually around uh, salt marshes and deserts. And I think this one is a coyote brush. Can somebody confirm that? Because I, I took this at Alviso and I think there was coyote brush growing at the time, but I'm not 100% sure it could be something else. It looks like female coyote bush in seed. Ah. Yeah, this is a slightly older photograph. I wasn't being as attentive to plants at the time. I'm being more now. This is an umber skipper on thistle. Again, I didn't get the species of the thistle at the time. Thistles have been very good for photographing butterflies, I've found. I often get really good photos on them. And I, I guess we have a mix of the native and non-native thistles in the Bay Area, right? And the butterflies seem to not disc discriminate that much on that. All right, moving on to another nice uh, group of insects is the Odonoita, which is dragonflies and damselflies. So the two on the left are damselflies, the four on the right are dragonflies. Damselflies tend to be uh, much more sort of delicate, uh, thinly built. The one on the top left is a sooty dancer. The one below that is a Pacific folktail. And then there's the black saddlebags and the flame skimmer. The flame skimmer is fairly common in backyards uh, in, the Bay, in the Bay Area. It seems to adapt well to suburban life. Then the flying one at the top right is a blue-eyed uh, skimmer. And then the one below that is an eight-spotted skimmer. Again, there's a lot more, there's about 60 species or so of dragonflies and damselflies that you can see in the Bay Area. And to me, you know, I originally I was much more focused around mammals, birds, reptiles, but slowly I've been expanding and it's been a lot of fun to learn more about butterflies and dragonflies and now wildflowers. This is just a nice picture. These, they're usually flying and very hard to kind of photograph, but these were perched nicely and I was able to get up close and take a nice photo. Blue-eyed darners. Ah. So I had taken a photo of this wasp on the right. It's a pollen wasp feeding on uh, penstemon, right? Fertile penstemon. And recently I took another photo of a wasp on the phacelia. And I was intrigued to learn that different species of wasps are specializing on different flowers. So just by the fact that it was on that flower, somebody said, oh yeah, it must be this one. And you know, if somebody's interested, I have the scientific names. So the genus is Pseudomassaris and 
The one on the Penstemon is Vespoids and the one on the Facilia is Edward Z. So I thought that was pretty cute. And I thought uh, this group would appreciate that difference. Totally. So and there was a question from Erin about your butterfly slide. Sure. Uh, one of the thistles, she was, or oh, maybe, maybe either this one or the one with the thistle, this one, she wanted to know, is this cobweb thistle? As I said, and, I wasn't paying enough attention to kind of capture that. Yeah. It looks like bull thistle. Ah. Non-native. Ah. Thank you. Yeah. Like I said, Thank the you. butterflies don't seem to discriminate that much. So I've had good luck with either native or not native thistles in terms of photography. Yeah. Now I should mention that in the chat window, there's a link posted to the discovery of red-bellied newts. People are invited to check it out. Ah, somebody found it. Nice. Yeah. And uh, there's a general question for you, Amit. What tips do you have for photographing wildlife? So you can you can take it now or you can take it at the end. Why don't we take it at the end, that one? Yeah. Okay. okay. That, that's a good one to take at the end. All right. We are getting close to the end anyway. So great. Okay, so we just finished with the wasps. All right. And here's a variety of other insect life. Um, the grasshopper, I was not able to get to species level. It's some kind of short wing grasshopper. Uh, the bee is a horn-faced leaf cutter bee. It's on Rosilla. And the bee fly is on Coyote Mint. And then in the bottom, you have the convergent lady beetles on Manzanita. And the spotted mm -hmm. cucumber beetles on Grindelia. Mm -hmm. And the black-tailed bumblebee is on white whorehound. And again, I took a selection of photos specifically to show the, uh, you know, synergy between plants and uh, insect life. Yeah, yeah. And again, th all of these insects is a whole area which I'm learning slowly more and more about. And of course, iNaturalist is a great resource. Bug Guide used to be the great resource for, but now iNaturalist has become a much better resource for learning about the different species and getting your uh, photographs identified. Including for plants, I would say. So I would like to give a plug on that that if people in this group who are knowledgeable about plants are not on iNaturalist, I would highly encourage you to get in there and help people like me identify stuff that we find in a photograph out there. I'm surprised how difficult I've found it sometimes to still identify plants that I've taken, you know, fairly good close-ups maybe. And now I'm learning to take like different angles, take different aspects of the leaf and uh, things like that. But even then it's, it's not easy to identify plants and anybody with expertise would really contribute to that, I think. All right, moving away from insects. This is another cool wildlife sighting. Uh, if you're not, uh, if you don't have a phobia of spiders, I find them pretty cool. And uh, I think we are about at the tail end of the tarantula season for this year. September, October is a good time to see them typically. And they're found uh, all over the Bay Area. They, I used to think they were much more on the East Bay, but uh, apparently they're in the Santa Cruz Mountains also. And so you, you have a chance of seeing them in many places. And they are, uh, you know, they don't venomous, they don't, uh, their bite doesn't do anything to you. What they do is their hair can be very itchy. So they shed hair. And if that kind of gets in, uh, into your skin, then that can be a little bit painful, but it's not that bad from what I've read. Another interesting spider mm. is the Black Widow. It's a pretty small spider, this is a close up. And this one is venomous. But again, I found them not to be, you know, particularly something to worry about. I've actually had them in my backyard. I've seen them many times. They seem to kind of keep to their corners and not really, you know, go out of their way to cause any trouble. So, so is the red patch significant? Yeah, that, that's a diagnostic for a black widow. So there's a similar spider called a false uh, black widow and that one does not have the red hourglass mark. And this is a female. The female is large and has that mark. The male is kind of tiny and male is not the one that will bite you. So this is, mark is on the underside of Under the belly? Correct, correct. I see. I see. Cool. 
proof. But again, I you know read about black widows long before I actually saw one, so I thought it was cool to actually find one close by. And then there's a, there's a comment that um, yeah, false widows have a skull pattern. Ah, oh, I see. Cool. All right. So another sort of new frontier is tide pooling. I've started doing that a lot more now. And uh, this is one of the cool species I saw is a striped shore crab. There's a variety of crabs that are found along the bay, bay area. And of course, you oh, on top of crabs, you get all kinds of the shells, uh, nudie branches, and all kinds of cool, cool creatures that I'm looking forward to learning about. OK. So we are pretty much done with the sweep of species. Now we have a couple of more general slides and then we can start winding up. So here are just some of the locations which I find you know, good for wildlife around the Bay Area. There's of course tons of places and anything with a reasonable large um, natural habitat will be too good. And here's the you know, kind of calendar of sort of when to look for specific things that I think are worthy. And I think we touched on this as we talked about those particular species. So this is something if somebody's interested, I can easily just share this table later by email or something. I think now, it would be- I will be adding this to my website. I don't, sorry, what was that, Armin? No, I was just saying it would be very helpful if these slides could be, especially these last two, uh huh. Yeah. Could be could be shared. Yeah, I can share them. And like this one, I'm going to turn it also into a web page on the website, so then okay. it'll be easy to find later. But for now, I, I I'll share it with the, the participants or you know however you want to send it to them. But yeah, this is a selection of some of the things I talked about. But these are all uh, things that are kind of interesting enough to see or to you know take kids to see them and things like that. So I. I Whereas uh, some of the wildlife is kind of hard to see and you require a lot of patience and it's more of a, it's a different experience. This is just some general advice that may be somewhat obvious. You know, the, the, it's very seasonal, different species are common at different times of the year. It's also a time of day affects what you see. So depending on what you're looking for, you have to target different parts of the day. And highly recommend binoculars. They really, you know, add to the experience of seeing wildlife. And there's great resources out there. iNaturalist, eBird for birds, and SFA Wildlife info. My website. And then my website, SFA Wildlife info. It has some basic information, but then it has pointers to a lot of other things. So mostly, it's a set of links that you can use to go exploring further all over about those uh, wildlife that you see. So that brings us to an end. So and you had a question about, oh, there's a new one. Are baby black widows more deadly than adults? And is this true for other species of spiders? Not from anything I've read. And I don't see why there would be, because I think the amount of venom would be somewhat proportional to the size of the animal. And I know there was a myth around uh, rattlesnakes that I, I, I recall reading uh, some expert uh, discrediting that, where they said baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous because they don't know to withhold their venom. And apparently that, is, that doesn't have scientific basis. So, okay. And so just, the I, open question was, what tips do you have for photographing wildlife? Right. So one thing, one specific thing I find, so it depends on the kind of photography you want to do. So if you want to take those spectacular close-ups of birds and things like that, then you want one of those huge lenses with a tripod and you want to go to you know, places, particularly with waterfall or whatever, you can set it up and take pictures. What I tend to do is I'm taking photos as I go around hiking and looking. And so I want something that is very portable, easy to carry with me. And I recently found a lens that I really like. It's like a 18 to 400 zoom. So it gives me incredible range. It takes very good close-ups of insects are good enough. 
again, it won't be as good as a dedicated macro lens, but I find that having to change lenses or anything in the field kind of is distracting and gets in the way of looking for wildlife and seeing wildlife. Mm -hmm. So I just carry this one camera, it's a Canon, um, it's fairly old at the stage, with, with this lens, which gives me this incredible range. So with that, I'm able to, you know, basically all the photographs that you saw here were taken with that kind of setup. I used to have one that was 28 to 300, and now I have a slightly better one, which is 18 to 400. And I highly recommend getting something like that. So that kind of makes, makes it so that you have your camera with you and available and ready when you see, because you never know when you're going to see something. So is that lens also a Canon lens? That no, I, Canon lenses are very expensive to try to get. And I don't think even they have one in that wide range. So this is a Tamron. I think Tamron and Sigma have lenses like with that wide range. Okay. And you lose a little bit in the sharpness maybe. But again, so if you're trying to take pictures that you're going to you know, get published in a magazine, that's a different story. But if you're trying to document what you see for your own enjoyment and to share with others, then this lens does a good enough job. And I mean, you can judge for yourself, you know, with the photos that you saw. And of course, so even that you have to crop sometimes because it's just wildlife is not easy to get close to often. So, How do you get the dragonflies to sit still? So it depends on the species. Like I said, I almost find it, that was incredible luck that I found the blue-eyed uh, darner sitting like that. But Otherwise, darners tend to just keep flying and I've pretty much given up on it. I can't even ID them sometimes because you can't even get your binoculars on them. But flame skimmers will give you great poses all the time. And so several of those other dragonflies will sit down. And you just have to have a little bit of patience and hang around where they're flying. And then once in a while, they will sit down somewhere. So it's a combination of sort of being in the right place and some luck, but also the species. There's a comment here from Ray. He says, I was a docent at Sunol Regional Park for 10 years, and I completely agree with Hamid's statements with regard to rattlesnakes and tarantulas. Sunol mm -hmm. is also a great place to see yellow-billed magpies. Yes, Sunol is one of my favorite places. In fact, several of the photos you saw today were at Sunol. And there are several helpful comments. I won't read them all, but... Um, I encourage everyone to, to browse the chat window. So any further questions for Amit? If not, I want to thank you, Amit, very much for sharing your pictures and your commentary with us. It's been really informative. Um, living in the Bay Area, I think I've lived here 40 years. There's still some new stuff to learn. A lot of yeah, new stuff. That, that, that's the point of the talk is to get people excited that, yeah, there is so much cool stuff. Go out there and look. Yeah. So on behalf of uh, the audience and the Native Plant Society, thank you very much. And all of you have a good night. And we'll see you at the next talk. Very cool. And I, I promised I will share the names of those locations for the uh, Central Valley. Oh, you did. Called. You did. Yes, we will I'll wait for that. I will put that in the chat. So, Arvind, will you, will you archive the chat? Um, I Are think it should, be, it should be possible. We certainly get a copy of it. Oh, okay. As long yeah. as, yeah, okay. Yeah. Then you can share it even in an email to the participants or something, right? So, as long yeah. as I get you the names, you can share it around easily. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everyone.